Lihe, coming of autumn. Wind in the plane trees startles my heart to a man's bitter grief. In the guttering lamplight, spinners cry their icy silk. Who will ever read these slips of green bamboo? Or forbid the ornate worm to pierce its powdery holes? Such thoughts tonight must disentwine my knotted heart. In the cold rain comes a fragrant spirit to console this poet. On an autumn grave, a ghost sits chanting that poem of Pau's. A thousand years in earth makes emerald jade that rancorous blood. So this will be the last poem of Li Hei that we include in this series. And uh, I think with, we've included about 14 or so poems of his, which makes him pretty representative. And I think that would be, as a percentage, this is all evidently a subjective appreciation, but that would put him in the place he probably would have deserved to be in the 300 Tangs anthology. Okay, a little bit about this poem. So this is a seven-character poem with two rhymes. It's uh, also, I think it's an old-style poem. It, it definitely does not fa fit the usual conventions of line of, 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 of a regulated poem. Uh, the topic. So coming of autumn. Autumn is a very, very frequent topic, as you will already have noticed from these videos, in classical Chinese poetry. It's the favorite season. It has this melancholy tinge. Yeah, it's beautiful, you know, what with the red falling leaves and, and the frost. But it's also, you know, the beginning of decline and death. And it's associated with, with elements like those of decline, sadness, melancholy, and physical decay. We've got that here, but we've got more things. In fact, this is an unusual <laughs> autumn poem. It has the, some of the uh, sad images of autumn, but it's very, very subjective, very, very personal. It's a Li He poem with Li He's complaints about his lack of recognition, the possible disappearance of his written works, his frustration even after death at not being recognized. And it also includes some signature elements of, of Li He that we've been talking about and that do not appear in most scholar-official poems, like the presence of the supernatural and probably some very strong images. And also the fact that the lines are a bit, um, how could we say it, they feel like a juxtaposition, but uh, you know they don't merge seamlessly into a clear story. Uh, um, th th this fragmentary nature is very, very typical of Lee Hay's poem. I wouldn't say the poem is completely fragmentary, but um, you know sometimes it's difficult to to establish the clear thread of 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 the story uh, from from couplet or line to couplet or line. And we've already commented how all these elements, the, 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 the rich, uh, exuberant descriptiveness, the, the presence of the supernatural, the fragmentary, you know, really associates him in, in, in our Western mind with, with maybe the decadentist poets or the symbolists of 19th century France. Anyway, this translation, by the way, is uh, J.D. Frodsham's. Uh, I have another one by uh, A.C. Graham, which I'll be reading at the end. So the topic of the poem, we've already mentioned it. It's the sadness of autumn, uh, the passage of time and death, and more specifically, uh, Lee Hayes, the poetic persona's own, and, and they feel like, not just a poetic persona, they feel like Lee Hayes' uh, personal and subjective frustrations at the possibility of his works being forgotten and him not being recognized, given the merit he deserves. Let's take a look at the poem line by line, or couplet by couplet. So first two lines. Uh, wind in the plane trees startles the heart. Sorry, startles my heart to a man's bitter grief. In the guttering lamplight, spinners cry their icy silk. 
So we begin with two images of nature, of a plant and of an animal. And uh, they're both autumn uh, plants, I imagine. Plain trees, the, these seem to be in a footnote by Frodsham, Sterculia platanifolia, which uh, must be a, a, a plant, uh, the, the plain tree, uh, that is very representative of autumn. Or at least the sound of the wind in its leaves must be representative of autumn. In fact, the other translation mentions the Wutung tree, uh, and uh, I do know that uh, the wind shedding the leaves of the Wutung tree is a typically autumn sound. So we have this wind on the leaves of a tree, and this evokes the sadness of autumn. So, so bitter grief is aroused in the heart of the poet, and this is very typically Chinese, like uh, the poems express the subjective reaction to an objective correlate in nature. So we are at the season of sadness, the wind is blowing, making a sound in the leaves which evokes sadness in the poetic persona. And a second image gets uh, juxtaposed. This was an oral image, the sound of the wind in the leaves. The second one is also oral, although it has some visual it's a combination of visual and oral. In the gathering lamplight, spinners cry their icy silk. Very, very unusual image. For first, first of all, spinners is a euphemism or, or, or um, metaphoric nickname for the uh, for the crickets. Yeah, it's a common name for crickets because their hum uh, resembles that of the spinning wheel, and crickets are a very usual trope evoking autumn, and the cries are meant to be the cries of sadness at the greater cold and imminent death. So we get gathering lamplight, so it's it's night. The first line just told us that it was probably autumn, and we heard that sound of the wind and the leaves. Now we get time of day. It must be evening or night, because we have lamplights on. Uh, their light is fading away, and in that gathering lamplight, we can hear the spinners crying their icy silk. So the spinners would be, as I said, they're a nickname for the for the crickets. Now, uh, we, we, this image juxtaposes the visual and the oral, the the, the machine and uh, the, the 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 insect. So we have the spinners that would would be used, the machines that would be used for producing silk. But uh, this is juxtaposed on the spinners crying. <laughs> their icy silk. So the sound of the crickets, uh, their cry sounds like or is like icy silk, like the icy silk that a real spinning machine would be producing. And again, silk, it's not, it's defined as icy silk here, cold silk, mm, perhaps white silk, uh, the natural color of, of, of the material. Uh, uh, evidently, this iciness, this coldness evokes again the season. Well, uh, so, so autumn is a season of cold, not as much as winter, but it's, it's, it's on its way. So these two oral images, the wind on the plane trees, uh, the cry of icy silk by the spinners, and I, I insist this is a, quite an unusual, for me at least, um, metaphor. It's, it's an interesting line. Uh, okay, yeah. So, so these two images are these two oral and partially visual images are the background that locates us in sad autumn, where the author is feeling melancholy. Uh, next line, and the next line moves on to a more subjective and personal, apparently, uh, interpretation. And it's basically well, the next two lines, they're about uh, the poetic persona sighing, thinking what will happen to his literary creations, including this very self-poem that we are reading now. Who will ever read these slips of green bamboo, or forbid the ornate worm to pierce its powdery holes? So, slips of green bamboo, uh, traditionally, probably not so much at Lee, uh, at Lee, in Lee Hay's time, but before that, traditionally, books in China were basically made by tying together um, rectangular and uh, vertical slips of bamboo. And you would write characters up and down, and you would read the slips from right to left, I believe. I'm not completely sure about this. But, uh, yeah, those were books, so they were actually bundles of books written on bamboo. 
And so, so here, very poetically, Li Hei is asking who will read probably his slips of green bamboo, his poetic works, and who would protect them from the ravages of time, where the ravages are represented by the worms, these ornate worms, who pierce the bamboo, who make, you know, holes in, in, the, in the books, and therefore eat them away and destroy them. So not only is it a sad season, the, the first, the melancholy uh, ideas in the first lines about the sad season are joined to a more personal sadness at the possibility that one's literary works might not achieve the immortality they might deserve or you might wish for. Uh, so, so the next line uh, seems to take us again uh, to, 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 to the subjective self of the poet complaining and feeling sad. Such thoughts tonight must disentwine my knotted heart. So, so we are having these thoughts that, uh, that, that, that are, you know, making me suffer uh, the thought of my works being destroyed, but other thoughts that I'm also going maybe to talk about in the next lines. So the next two form a parallelistic couplet uh, which uh, reeks of the supernatural as, as in each of the lines we have the appearance of a ghost of sorts. In the cold rain comes a fragrant spirit to console this poet. On an autumn grave a ghost sits chanting that poem of Pau's. So two ghosts intrude in the poem one seems to come to the poet's inner quarters. It's described as a fragrant spirit. Uh, some translators think this refers to a dead girl's spirit. So in this cold rain, it's autumn rain, the poet seems to be receiving consolation from a supernatural presence that comes to visit him and to console him. And outside, so, so, so this ghost brings, it's a ghost, but it seems to be bringing some slight surcease of sorrow. Uh, the other line, on the contrary, presents as a poet that is, uh, sorry, a supernatural creature that is hammering in the message of death, decay, and disappearance. On an autumn grave, a ghost sits chanting that poem of Pau's. Now this is, you know, this feels like the quintessential Li Hei line. Yeah? So, so the picture is of a, a grave, a graveyard cemetery in autumn, and there's a ghost chanting a poem, a poem of Pao's. So this poem is um, a poem from the 5th century. This would have been the, the, the Graveyard Lament, the Dai Hao Li Xing, uh, which was written by the 5th century poet Bao Chao, or Pao Chao, a poem that says, Rich and poor all meet the same end, differing wishes granted or unfulfilled. Galloping waves urge on eternal night. Falling dew hastens the brief dawn. So it's a, you know, a poem on, on, on the, the inevitable disappearance and death of all things. It's a poem of the grave. So in the grave, at the same time that he is receiving this consolation from this fragrant spirit, uh, Li Hei cannot but hear or imagine he hears or think about an, yet another ghost on an autumn grave and singing the poem the famous poem of Pao's on the fugacity and uh, death of all human endeavors. Finally, the poem concludes with, uh, again, uh, quite a typical Li Hei type of ending that is ambiguous, uh, very expressive, very shocking, uh, very, very visual, very rich. A thousand years in earth makes emerald jade that rancorous blood. And, you know, this is a cryptic anecdote from the Chuang Tzu, book 26, about uh, a man called Chang Hung, who died in Shu, and had been unjustly uh, put to death. And three years after his burial, his blood had turned to emerald jade. So, so um, in line with the rest of the poem, with, uh, with, with Li Hei's apprehensions at his own possible incoming death in this melancholy autumn, at the forgetfulness that his works might incur upon. And, you know, the last line ends with what definitely feels like a tone of resentment uh, um, and of, of, of self-proclamation -pro of worthiness by equating himself with this unjustly executed man from the remote past. And uh, the resentment that Ho Ma he might feel embodied in the poems he has written, maybe metaphorically, with his very blood,
and, and, and these poems of his will turn into precious jade with the passage of time. Uh, just as the blood of uh, Chang Hung demonstrated his innocence by turning into the precious jade, the poems of Li Hei, if they survive and are read in the future, will turn into jade, emerald jade, proclaiming his worthiness as a poet and as a person. So, you know, very interesting uh, take, and I think it's a very good one for concluding Li Hei. And we can say that his poems have become emerald jade, and we've tried to give uh, a brief um, panorama of some of them in these videos. Uh, let's conclude with um, uh, reading uh, A.C. Graham's version of the same poem. Autumn comes. The wind in the wutung startles the heart, a lusty man despairs. Spinners in the fading lamplight cry chill silk. Who will study a bamboo book still green and forbid the grubs to bore their powdery holes? This night's thoughts will surely stretch my guts straight. Cold in the rain, a sweet phantom comes to console the writer. By the autumn tombs, a ghost chants the poem of Bao Chao. My angry blood for a thousand years will be emeralds under the earth.